Okay, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Alexander Mo. Um, he did his PhD in 2017 in Halle, then moved to Basel to work with Daniel Loss for a couple of years, a brief stay in TU Munich, and then moved to uh, Mainz uh, October last year as a emulator uh, group leader. Uh, his work is mostly focusing on well, topological transport, both of electrons, and more recently, the last few years, especially on the topological transport of uh, magnets, spin waves, about which you're going to talk. So it's my pleasure to, uh, to have you here. Please go ahead. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Rembert, and thank you very much for the invitation to Utrecht. It's um, already a great stay, and I'm happy to tell you something about um, topological magnons. So we will look at systems with a magnetically ordered state, such that the magnon picture is reliable. And I will in particular talk about what happens when these magnons interact with each other, because magnetization dynamics is intrinsically nonlinear, so these magnons are always strongly interacting with each other. And I will show you some aspects of how this influences the topology of the single particle spectrum of the magnons. As Rembel already told you, I'm currently working at the Johannes Gutenberg University of Mainz, where I'm leading um, an emulator group which is funded by the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft. Okay, so let me first give you the big picture. Why do we care about magnons and topological properties of them? Um, this line of research is mainly motivated by this grand challenge to come up with new technologies with a minimal environmental impact uh, from their power requirements. And we have the problem with CMOS technology that we always have dual heating and it's running to an end um, when it comes to miniaturization. And so one idea would be to replace the charge degree of freedom for, of the electrons with the spin degree of freedom. And doing so, one could then take it to the ultimate limit and encode information on the electrons, but in magnons, which mm -hmm. are the excitations above a magnetically ordered state, state because these magnons don't carry charge. And the idea would then be to somehow convert the electric information into magnetic or spin information, do all of the heavy lifting, the computations in the magnetic realm, and only convert back to an electric signal and read it out as necessary. So what are magnons? Magnons are spin waves, um, or quanta of spin waves. Some spin waves with different wavelengths are shown here. And those are the excitations above a magnetically ordered ground state here. It is the ferromagnet. And for the rest of the talk, we will look at systems that can be described by a spin Hamiltonian like this one here, where we have localized spin moments that interact with each other. And they can also be manipulated by an external magnetic field. So in contrast to electrons, magnons are bosons, so the statistics is different. They don't carry charge, which is why there will be no joule heating associated with the moving magnons, which is like the main attractive feat that they have for uh, computation. But magnons do carry spin and heat, so you can transport spin, or you can transport heat, like in a thermal Hall effect, or a spin Seebeck effect, or something like this. Now you could ask why would you use magnons and not photons, for example? Um, one main aspect is, of course, that photon wavelengths are much larger. So with magnons having wavelengths on the nanometer scale, you can really hope to go to the absolute uh, miniaturized limit. Another aspect is that uh, it's quite hard to make photons interact with each other. In contrast, magnons naturally interact with each other, which is associated with the nonlinear dynamics um, of each spin individually when it's interacting with the other spins. But since they are interacting with each other, there's also the problems that magnons decay on time scales much shorter than photons, for example. And this talk is about two aspects. One is uh, one idea to get around the decay processes, and then um, asking the question how good actually um, this strategy would be, and this is where now uh, we talk about topology. Here, I just quickly remind you of um, what you already know about topological materials. Um, so we will, for the rest of the talk, always consider churn insulating phases. And in a churn insulator, which is pretty much similar to the quantum hall insulator, 
you have edge states, so in the quantum Hall effect, you would have these semi-classical skipping orbits at the edges of the material due to magnetic field. And in germ insulators, this would be due to a intrinsic time reversal symmetry breaking, for example, due to magnetization. And in case space, you would find a fully occupied valence band, an empty conduction band, and then a single metallic state with definite chirality that connects the valence with the conduction band. And if the chemical potential happens to be in the band gap, you would only have this one conducting channel. Now it turns out, and I will show you some details in a second, that you can construct something like this also with magnets. So if you look, for example, at the ferromagnet here on the cargo lattice and calculate the micron spectrum, then it turns out that the micron spectrum, once projected on the edge of the sample, looks pretty similar to what we encounter in Sherman insulators. That means that you have these bulk band projections of, um, of bulk bands, and there's a band gap between these two bulk bands, and there's a single, me not metallic state, but a single gapless state that connects one band gap with the other. Now, the main difference is, of course, that in the electronic realm, this is a topological ground state, while for the microns, the ground state is topologically boring. It's just the ferromagnetically ordered state, and it's only the excitations above the ground state that's topological. So what you could do is, this at zero temperature, this is an empty spectrum. There are no microns excited, but once you excite a micron at this momentum, at this energy, then you would excite this edge state which would go around the sample only in one direction. And then similarly to the case of chiral electronic edge states, it can't elastically backscatter at a defect, for example, simply because there is no other state at the same energy to scatter into. And this is how you can get around disorder and defect scattering, which would reduce the micron lifetime. And this is why we hope that you could use these chiral edge states to produce long-lived microns. So on, a, on the level of a technological vision, ideally you would have a situation like this, where this is a topological micron material, you excite at the edge, and then the information, the magnetically encoded information goes around the sample, and then you would combine the absence of backscattering plus the absence of, absence of Joule heating that comes with the magnetic excitations. Now let's look a little bit deeper into theory. I already told you that we look at systems described by uh, localized spin Hamiltonians. And on the classical level, we would calculate these microns or spin waves by looking at the equation of motion of um, a classical spin. And this would be the landau lifshitz gilbert equation that describes the damp precession of the spin in the affected magnetic field of its neighbors. Upon linearization, you would get these excitations. Here, however, in the rest of the talk, I will be concerned with a spin to boson transformation that goes under the name of holstein primakov transformation from spins S to bosons A that in full glory is written here. So the spins are mapped onto bosons A. X, Y, and Z is just a local coordinate system with the Z direction along the direction of the ordered state. But you can see that there are these F objects which themselves are a square root of these bosons, and to make sense of that, you have to expand the square root. And uh, you can already see that this works either in the limit where you have um, only a few microns, such that the expectation value of A dagger A is small, or in the limit of large spin. This is why we call this the semi-classical um, expansion. Once you do this, to plug the spins back into the Hamiltonian, you end up with an expansion of the Hamiltonian in terms of bosonic operators, where H0 does not contain any bosons, so that's a classical ground state energy. H1 uh, is better be, should better be zero, because that would describe the spontaneous creation of a magnum. But as long as you expand around a stable state, H1 vanishes. And then the interesting part to describe microns would be H2. That's the free theory of microns that you can just diagonalize to get the length structure. And everything beyond H3, H4 describes the interactions between three, four, <coughs> and microns. Now, let me give you a simple example of what it takes to find topological microns. For that, let's assume that we are concerned with spins sitting at the vertices of the honeycomb lattice 
and they interact with the nearest neighbors with ferromagnetic Heisenberg exchange. Then we would get a ferromagnetic ground state. We could perform this expansion, we would get H2. And then we could diagonalize it, and we would find a Markman spectrum like the one shown here, which resembles the electronic spectrum of graphene. Again, the difference is, of course, that zero energy is here at the band bottom and not, not at the level of the Dirac codes. But due to the uh, presence of sublattice or inversion symmetry and time reversal symmetry, these Dirac cones are gapless. So they are protected by the simultaneous presence of these two symmetries. Now you could ask, well, time reversal symmetry should be broken simply by the magnetic order. However, what we talk about here is some kind of effective time reversal symmetry that works as follows. You can apply actual time reversal, which flips the magnetic direction. But then, since spin space is isotropic, you can perform a rotation by 180 degree back in spin space, which doesn't change the Hamiltonian, to map the texture back onto itself. And this is the effective time reversal symmetry that stabilizes the Dirac codes. So in order to gap out the Dirac cones, we need to break spin space isotropy. This can be done by introducing second nearest neighbor interaction in the form of the Alushinsky Maria interaction, which is given by a vector that is dotted into the cross product of two spins. And you see these little arrows indicated here, so the DMI vectors would point on the out of plane. Now, if you do the same kind of Markman calculation, you would find that these uh, Dirac cones get gapped out because time reversal symmetry is broken. Let's appreciate that also on the level of these little arrows. So once you apply actual time reversal, you can't rotate back in spin space because the DMI vectors break the isotropy in spin space. So if you try to rotate back in spin space, the DMI terms would not be invariant under this rotation. Um. A simple question. So, so this is of course one way to break like the symmetry, um, but um, would just the magnetic field also break the symmetry? No, the magnetic field itself would not suffice because you would just shift all the magnets up in energy. But that would break the spin symmetry, right? Um, because then you cannot then rotating uh, one degree. Well, you, in the sense you can rotate back, if you say that the magnetic field is an external thing which gets not rotated right, then the magnetic field would be just given by external um, setup, and then you can rotate back and you would still get the same situation. Okay. Right, okay, and um, now you can use the machinery that we know from um, single particle uh, band structure theory which means that you find the lattice periodic part of the magma eigenfunctions. You can find the so-called Barry curvature, geometric property of the block bands. And from that, you can calculate a topological invariant, the churn number, which turns out to be different from zero in this case. And this then tells you, by virtue of the bulk boundary correspondence, that you would find these chiral edge states in the band gap. So what was crucial here is that we have to break this effective time reversal symmetry, T prime, which is a combination of actual time reversal symmetry and some rotation in spin space. And for the x this is just the magnonic counterpart of the Holden model that you would know from the electronic realm. Can you just, just, just remind us, so if you do this, try to do a similar trick with graphene, and often the columns very easy, but there is no topology there. So what was the magic ingredient here? So there are, um, for spinless electrons on graphene, you have four ways to open these band gaps, right? You can introduce these holding time reversal symmetry breaking terms. You can uh, break the sublattice symmetry, like introducing a seven of mass term. That you could do the same here by choosing different spins, for example. Here, these DMI terms actually give rise to these um, phase factors which look at if, as if you had charged particles that move around the magnetic flux. Now, um, this story works also in higher dimension. So if you look at the second order topological phases where you have chiral markmans at the hinges of a three-dimensional material. Here I just flash an example where we stack these honeycomb layers in a particular way 
and perform atomistic spin dynamic simulations based on the Landau-Lipschitz Gilbert equation. And I just want to show you this that without this order, you can nicely see that the chiral edge state goes around the sample. But even with this order, we see that the chiral state, although it's kind of blurred out by the disorder, still goes around the sample in unidirectional fashion simply because there's no other state to backscatter into. Now, there are many topological Markman phases discussed in literature, and here I, I'm very selfish and just flash my own papers. Mm. Sorry, the, the previous slide, oh, yes. you showed that when it reaches some point, then it goes to two. Do we have two edges this day or no? Can you repeat the question? I mean, that here, and then the left hand side, so the, the, I see the two marks there. Oh, sorry, this is not two marks. This, so uh, the simulation just assumes that there is a local magnetic field of the right frequency, which keeps um, exciting the modes. And here you just get an interference between the mode that is arriving and the mode that you're still um, pumping. That you're still pumping, exactly. So this is not another mode. This is just a, uh, let's say, an interference of the amplitude which is encoded in this color. Okay, so so the it's only one mode. Right. Sorry. So here I just want to flash that um, you can also realize phases with higher churn numbers, which would then just translate into several edge states um, on the edge. You can also realize models in antiferromagnets, for example, where you can uh, get helical edge states, where a magnon would spin up would go in this direction, a magnon would spin down would go in opposite direction, which is then pretty much similar to um, topological insulators and electronic systems. You can also realize three-dimensional topological phases which come with bio cones of magnets, then you would also get something like Fermi arcs at the surfaces, and you can also realize nodal line magnets. But for the rest of the talk, I will focus on churn insulated phases. Now you could ask the question, um, what does it actually take to realize magnet topology on the uh, larger scale? So I talked so far about this model where we have a ferromagnet with DMI. The same works, of course, on a different lattice, for example, the cargo may lattice where the DMI vectors would then exist already between nearest neighbors because these points <coughs> don't have an inversion symmetry. But there are other possibilities. For example, you could take inspiration from quantum optics and study squeezing, where squeezing in the magnetic context just means that the circular precession of the spins is squeezed such that it would become elliptical. For example, on the cargo lattice, if you have different squeezing axes, so some kind of local anisotropy, and if these axes um, are non-uniform, then you can already see that as you go around the triangle, the axis of ellipticity would rotate, and that would also break this time reversal symmetry and get out the Dirac magnets. The same works um, for bond-dependent an isotropic exchange on the um, honeycomb lattice, for example, if you have a field polarized Kitaev model. And then you can also have a situation where you have a non collinear texture, then simply by the rotating quantization axis about which you perform the magnon expansion, you would also get this time reversal symmetry breaking terms. This is in particular realized, for example, for magnetic super lattices in the form of Skirmberg lattices. But the main message is. Since magnons are intrinsically scalar particles, you need a non Bravé lattice to have some kind of isospin degree of freedom to introduce at least two bands such that you can discuss topology. In this talk, I will show you later that in quantum magnets, even in Bravé lattices, you can find topological excitations when you take into account um, more complicated spin excitations than magnets. Can I ask a maybe technical question about? The B, example B here, and um, do you still, so the churn number is then defined a little bit more elaborate, I guess, if you have uh, squeezing. Uh, right, so the main difference is, of course, that here you would introduce pairing terms, so right. magnum number non-conserving terms, but this just means that you have to take into account that, okay, you have to you work in number space of the Bukolibov transformation, and then the Barry curvature just gets renormalized with this bosonic pairing metric. But overall, the spirit is the same. Yeah, okay, maybe we can also discuss it because in principle, the, 
the squeezing itself gives also an elliptic, uh, sorry, a uh, geometric phase, which is, I guess, slightly different than that one even. So, I think, but I'm not. Right, like, so that would be like the difference between a geometric or a topological phase, one, exactly. for example, in a ring. I, I think so, yes. So, I think here I'm mainly talking about geometrical phases, but yeah, we can discuss maybe Yeah, I think it's maybe too technical to discuss now, but I would be interesting to, interested in your opinion. So let me just quickly flash uh, some experimental evidence that we have for the um, existence of chiral edge states or topological markers. So one thing that we can do is, of course, um, we can perform inelastic neutron scattering. So neutron goes in, neutron goes out, and if you excite it in Markman, then you see this in the energy loss and the inelastic neutron scattering. And here you see data performed on a honeycomb ferromagnet. And you can see in the data that there's one magnon branch, then again, and then another magnon branch. Then you can fit that to a microscopic model and then see, okay, the model is topological. So maybe the spectrum was topological as well. You don't see chiral edge states in neutron scattering simply because chiral edge states only live at the edge and there's not enough signal when a neutron comes in because the neutron is almost, um, is very weakly interacting with the sample. Then another. So, uh, sorry, but so in that sense, the neutron scattering would only be uh, a proof of the existence of edge states under the assumption that the model I use is, right. Uh, is, is the right. Exactly. So the thing is, neutron scattering can only take, tell you something about the bulk band structure, mm -hmm. but in principle, you could cook up uh, most probably a not topological model which would yield the yeah, same yeah, band structure. Yeah. So you need some extra information, maybe some DFT calculations or symmetry considerations to see what kind of model would be allowed. And so you need extra information. Another indirect experiment would be transverse transport. You know, for example, for electrons that you have the anomalous Hall effect, which tells you that you have, um, you apply an electric field and you get a current in transverse direction, which is proportional to the bearing curvature. Similarly, for microns, you have T transport of microns. So you apply temperature gradient and get a transverse heat current response quantified by the transverse heat conductivity. The first example was showing lutetium vanadite, where below the ordering temperature, you see that kappa xy becomes non-zero. And there are several contributions, of course, to kappa xy. It could be dominated by phonons, but if you assume that it's magnons mainly, and um, magnons are non-interacting, then you can describe it as an integral of the barrier curvature multiplied by some weighting function. Uh, but of course, in experiments, um, it's hard to disentangle intrinsic contributions from extrinsic contributions that could be due to skew scattering. And there, of course, could also be many body corrections to this expression. So this, again, is a rather indirect proof. However, um, a lot of materials have been discussed in the context of Markov topology. I will not go through this list. I will just show you that there's also these famous van der Waals materials that are ferromagnetic on the monolayer limit to so chromium uh, triiodide and chromium tribromide. Now here, uh, I promise to talk about interacting topological microns. So we have the hope that maybe we can use topological microns in the context of spintronics or maybe even for quantum computing to entangle two spin qubits. But um, although topological microns are robust against disorder scattering, so far, topology only um, tells you something about the properties of the free theory. And you have to ask the questions, what happens beyond? In particular, there is a number of non-conserving magnon interactions, which is an interaction that you wouldn't find, for example, in the electronic realm. So it's also a fundamentally interesting question to ask what this number non-conserving term is doing. And this is what I'm going to address in the rest of this talk. I would like to show you two examples of the influence on, of H3. I will first show you that H3 can introduce topological magnons, so where the interactions give rise to topology. And then I will also show you an example where these H3 terms give rise to hybridization between single magnons and more exotic magnetic excitations, um, which are two magnon bound states. But let me first discuss um, how we um, 
describe the effect of H3. So what we typically do is we know the harmonic theory and then H3 is a hopefully small correction to the free theory and then we use many body perturbation theory. So we would evaluate self-energy diagrams that are associated with H3 to lowest order would be this one, Magnon comes in, splits into two Magnons and then recombines and that gives a correction to the single particle propagator. And you can already see if the energy of this Magnon is the same as the energy of these intermediate Magnons, then there's a resonance and the Magnon can decay into the continuum. And you see something like this in neutron scattering experiments on quantum Magnons where you see a nice sharp single particle peak which then suddenly terminates. So something happens to the single particle wave. In particular, it is believed that it enters the continuum of two Magnon excitations and then the single particle wave gets distributed over the continuum and it looks as if the quasi-particle is completely wiped out. We studied something like this uh, in magnetic um, superstructures like skirmian crystals where magnons comes in and plays into two others. And you see here the spectral function of the magnons in this case where you have sharp excitations at low energy, but at higher energy it gets uh, increasingly blurred out simply because magnons at high energy have a lot of possibilities to decay into magnons at lower energies. And if you have a very large lifetime of magnons, then of course the notion of topology becomes jeopardized. Um, these decays have been discussed in other contexts, in particular also in the context of non-Hermitian um, topology. I'm not going to address these aspects, but if you would like to um, get the full picture of decays, I really recommend this review article. So you mean that something like weak localization? Weak localization. So that would be transport effect, right? Yeah. So I'm not sure that anyone has ever looked at that, but it's an interesting question. I can't really comment on that. Right, so the question that I would like to address is um, decay and lifetime effects are detrimental to microtopology, but let's take the optimistic point of view and ask the question, if uh, three magnet interactions can also install topology. And for that, we have to cook up a situation where we are sure that it can do that. And the idea is as follows. We can um, have the situation in which we know that a spin Hamiltonian plus its ground state breaks a particular symmetry S. Then we do the Magnon expansion and it could be that accidentally the harmonic theory doesn't see the breaking of S. So this would respect S. Then to lowest order, only H3 or another higher order term would account for the breaking of S, which would then um, give rise to a correction due to the self-energy diagrams to the spectrum of H2. And now we can look at the situation in which this symmetry S is actually this effective time reversal symmetry that I was talking about in the beginning. Because then we would expect that we have a time reversal symmetric H2 and that the interactions would break this time reversal symmetry and would give rise to topological effects. For that, um, we have um, come up uh, with the following two models. They look pretty similar to the ferromagnetic honeycomb model that I showed in the beginning, but they are um, quite distinct in the following sense that in the model that I showed in the beginning, these DMI vectors were parallel to the magnetization direction. Here in both of these models, they are orthogonal to each other. In the first model that I refer to as the A chiral model, we apply a magnetic field to polarize all the spins in plane. And we still have these second nearest neighbor DMI terms that point out of plane. So that would be this Hamiltonian here. And in the model that I call the chiral model, we have a out of plane magnetic field that field polarizes the order. And we have interfacial DMI between nearest neighbors. This interfacial DMI um, arises if you break inversion symmetry, for example, by mounting the lattice on a substrate. It's a little bit similar like rush bus and orbit coupling, which also gives you this degree of handedness. I call this model a chiral model because without the magnetic field, the ground state would be a spin spiral. And for small magnetic fields, you could stabilize, for example, a skirmian crystal. 
But if the magnetic field is large enough, you enter the field polarized ferromagnetic state. Now, the crucial idea, as I already explained to you, is that once you perform the Markman approximation here, due to the nature of the DMI relative to the magnetization, it turns out that the harmonic theory only sees the terms that comes from the exchange and the magnetic field, but is blind to the DMI. And the DMI only enters then three Markman terms. That means in particular that if you calculate the harmonic theory, you get just these two Markman bands shown here in white again uh, with the Dirac points at the K and K prime points and the two models to the harmonic level are completely identical. Now let's discuss symmetries to anticipate what the DMI would do. In this a chiral model, you can again apply actual time reversal to reverse the magnetization direction. And then you notice that since the DMI vectors all point in the same direction, you can rotate back about the direction of the DMI, not changing the DMI vector. And you map back the texture onto the original texture. So in this model, you still have an effective time reversal symmetry. And you do not expect that the DMI gaps out the Dirac codes. Here in the chiral model, however, once you flip the magnetization direction, um, you are faced with the situation that the DMI spans a plane. So there's not a single direction about which you can rotate back without changing the other two orthogonal directions of the DMI vectors. So here you break the effective time reversal symmetry and expect on symmetry grounds that the Dirac cones must be gapped. So um, in order to see how the interacting Markman picture changes, we will now look at the many-body corrections. And for that, I first give you some kind of feeling for um, what one would expect from such a diagram. In particular, for the rest of the talk, we will focus at the K point because we are interested at the K point, um, at the zero cones. And we ask the question, what happens when we apply a magnetic field? We know from the single Markman excitations that the energy scales with B. So this Dirac cone would just change in energy linear with magnetic field. But now you see here in the background, there's a color plot. And this color plot encodes the two Markman continuum, so the density states of two Markmans. Let me explain what that is. The two Markman continuum is just the combination of any two free Markmans. In particular, you could ask the question, OK, if I take oh, sorry, this Markman and another copy of this Markman, that would bring me to the total momentum somewhere here. But the energy would be a little bit lower than the white line, simply because this is a parabolic band. This is why somewhere here there is a non-zero two Markman continuum. And if you have many possibilities to combine two Markmans to end up in the same spot in K and energy space, this just means that the density of states of the two Markman continuum is particularly large. And this could end up even then in these Van Hove singularity like features that you see in this colored background. Now, in particular, at the K point, you see that the two Markman continuum starts below the one Markman excitations. So it looks something like this. This means, in particular, if you now look at the self energy, um, that this thing can be anti Hermitian because a Markman could decay into two other Markmans. And when the energy of the two Markmans of the continuum is the same as that of the single Markman, you get decay effects. So for magnetic fields smaller than this critical value, we expect that the two Markmans would decay. At larger magnetic fields, since the continuum is a combination of two Markmans, it scales with two times B, so it rises more quickly with magnetic field and the single Markman excitations, there, um, the Markmans are kinematically forbidden to scatter into the continuum, which means that you can only have virtual processes which would go up into the continuum but go down back, and this would give rise to a permission part of the uh, self energy or was a single band to the real part of the self energy, which does not account for decay effects but just to a renormalization of the single particle excitations. So we expect that at large magnetic fields, we don't see decay, but only a renormalization of this green line. But at lower magnetic fields, we expect from this naive kinematic argument that we see decay effects. So now let's have a look at, let me 
I'm just showing you this again. What I will show you now, there's a little red box here. So I look at this momentum energy window, and I show a tomographic cut of the spectral function of the Mark norms here. So this, um, at the corner of the Beyond zone, and um, this is energy, and this is K-space. What I call zero energy here is the energy relative to the Dirac cone in the free theory. So the free theory, the Dirac cone is here, but you see um, in the renormalized spectrum, first of all, some lifetime broadening, but you see that in the a chiral model, the Dirac cone lives here and is still intact. This is uh, in agreement with our expectation because the a chiral model has this effective time reversal symmetry. In contrast, in the chiral case, where we break time reversal symmetry, we see that interactions introduce a bad gap. And we can look more closely at exactly the k-point where the bad gap opens, and there we see for the a chiral model, large magnetic fields, there's no damping, it's a sharp quasi-particle feature, but it's not gapped, so it's like two magnets on top of each other. But if low magnetic field, it kind of gets bent by the continuum, but then essentially it dissolves in the continuum and becomes lifetime broad. This is pretty similar in the chiral case. At low magnetic fields, you have this lifetime broadening, but at large magnetic fields, you see sharp quasi-particles, which are gapped due to the time reversal symmetry breaking nature of these interfacial DMI terms. Now the question is, is this gap topological? And the first um, hint that it is topological um, is the following. Once we perform this calculation with open boundary conditions, here along the y direction, you would get the edge spectrum like the one shown here. And if we zoom into the window of the edge states, then we see the black lines show what we would expect from the free theory, non directly There we see just Dirac cone projections with a chiral, with a sorry, with an edge state that is specialist, not chiral. But with interactions, you see this, the spectrum in the background. You see a positive velocity state at the right edge of the sample and the negative velocity state at the left edge of the sample. So indeed, we see magnets that go in a chiral fashion around the sample. So indeed, this system is topological. That means in particular that we can cook up a effective model um, to relate the barrier curvature that we know have in the system to the thermal <coughs> conductivity. So we are now faced with the situation that interactions between magnets give rise to a thermal Hall effect. And you see in particular that it's a very rich model. I don't go into the details. The main point is that for increasing temperature, you get quite sizable three-dimensional thermal conductivities if you stack the system, and you can get positive or negative contributions to the thermal Hall effect depending on the magnetic field that you apply. Oh. Uh, how is this very curvature calculated now for those? Uh, okay, excellent question. So what we did is the following. Um, we have the self-energy, and we just built an effective Hamiltonian from the free theory plus the self-energy. And then we use the very curvature of that effective Hamiltonian to calculate the very curvature. Perhaps you somehow expand the self-energy then around the pole or something like that. Uh, right, exactly. So, of course, there are many intricacies, like the uh, self energy being frequency dependent or something right, like this. Uh, but we uh, used here in particular the frequency of the Dirac cone to, yeah. uh, to do some approximation. Yeah. Okay, now let us understand why this has to be topological. Because when we looked at that, we thought it's uh, not obvious at all. So let me just quickly remind you of this figure that I showed in the beginning. This looks pretty much similar to this one. The only difference is that here I plot energy relative to the Dirac cone, which scales with magnetic field, which is why these lines look flatter than those lines here, but in principle, the idea is the same. And now our motivation is the following. We want to go in this large magnetic field regime to understand why we get the gap and why it's topological. So here we would just perform a real space perturbation theory to find arguments why it has to be topological. And then we ask the question, um, is perturbation theory actually correct in telling us that we would get a decay of Mark Lawrence? And there is um, good reason to have doubts because it's a lowest order perturbative argument. 
where you don't have a self-consistent um, talk between single particle renormalization and the continuum. So here we will perform a quantum simulation based on DMRG plus time dependent um, time evolution based on matrix product operators to see if this decay is really a physical thing or not. But let's start with the perturbation theory. And in this limit, what we do is the following. So we ask the question. Can I, can I ask you of course, yes. I a question before you, you show the actual answer. So if you go back to this image of the two lines crossing, so if I was just thinking about virtual processes that could happen just beyond B, B equals J, I guess, uh, I would expect that this would lower the energy of my states due mm -hmm. to these virtual processes. This would actually shift my D over J to the left. Which exactly. would allow even more virtual process in principle this to be a cascade. Uh, this is essentially what happens. Okay. <laughs> to spoil it a little bit. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> right. right. Anyway, I tell you the story. <laughs> so the idea is the following. We know that we have topological excitations in this system with the DMI vectors parallel to the magnetization. And we somehow want to map this model onto this in some limit. And the limit is large magnetic fields where we say, OK, the Zeeman term is the unperturbed Hamiltonian. And now all of the interactions are the perturbations. And we want to find a hopping between a single spin flip at site i to a single spin flip at site k, because we know that this would be a second order process where we have hope to find time reversal symmetry gradient terms. And what we do is. We know that we have to couple this through the continuum of two Markman excitations. So what we do is the following. We take a per perturbative step due to DMI. Since the DMI is in plane, it always couples the Z component to a letter operator. So we can create another spin flip. Then we can use the exchange to have the spin flips hot. And then in the end, we can take the Hermitian conjugate process of the DMI to kill the spin flip. And since the DMI vectors between um, this direction and this direction um, don't have the same angles. There's a phase mis mismatch which introduces the time reversal symmetry gradient terms. And this exactly maps onto Holden like terms um, with this perturbative prefactor, and this shows why the system has to break time reversal symmetry. Now, to the opposite direction for low magnetic fields, it's exactly as already anticipated. So what, we, what is plotted here is the following. We sit directly at the k point again and look at the spectral function. So as we cut through the k point, we would get in this plot one and two peaks due to the gap. And this is what's plotted here. So as a function of energy, we show the dynamical structure factor. And we start with large magnetic fields. That's this black line here. There essentially, you see only a single peak. But you have to believe me that there are two peaks here. It's just that the um, numerics doesn't resolve it. But you see that there are two peaks. If you go to lower magnetic fields, we come closer to the continuum. There you see a broadening of the peak. And here you can clearly identify now that the Dirac, Dirac magnets have split. And you see here um, in the perturbative calculation that single magnets enter the continuum, and then they these poles use quasi-particle residue, and um, you just have it in the continuum, this blurred effect. But here you see that the Dirac cones, um, sorry, the Dirac magnets actually survive. So it's still um, infinitely long-lived um, excitations. The only problem is that you lose quasi-particle residue to the continuum, which is this incoherent background. So the takeaway message would be that um, the topological magnets are stable, so they don't necessarily decay, as you would see in perturbation theory. But you lose quasi-particle residue to the continuum, which is why these excitations are an admixture of single particle excitations and some two particle excitations. So the main message here for the decay of magnets would be that before switching interactions, this naive kinematic argument would tell you that decays are possible here and impossible here. If you switch on interactions and calculate the perturbation theory, you see something like this. The two magnets split, but then they enter the continuum, and then they just dissolve because the single particle residue gets diluted. But in the non-perturbative theory, um, since you have an 
interaction between energy levels, and you know from quantum mechanics that an interaction between energy levels always leads to a repulsion. You see that the continuum actually doesn't eat the single particle excitations, but it repels the excitations. But of course, then you mix the eigenvectors and you lose single particleness into the continuum. But it's good um, news for topological magnonics because it tells you that, in principle, um, these lifetime argument that arguments are not as drastic as you would see in perturbation theory. But well, that's also sorry to yeah. that's also because of the low dimensions, I guess. That it would be 3D and Yes. It's so in, in 3D it's more complicated. So 1D and 2D are nice because the continuum comes with either a singularity or a step. Right. In 3D it's just a non-analytic function, but it's uh, continuous. But even in 3D, if the interactions are strong enough between the continuum and the mag uh, and the magnons, you would still expel it. But there you have to um, uh, use a so they need really strong quantum interactions to completely expel the single particle peak. This is actually discussed very nicely in the paper by by Ruben Theresen, not in the context of topological excitations, but in the context of single particle excitations. Right. So far, I talked about um, many body perturbative arguments where you consider the continuum as a incoherent bath into which you can dump the magnets. But you can also ask the question if there are any coherent effects between single particle space and this two body, two micron space. And this is what I would like to address in the final minutes of the talk. And what I will look at is a spin one half model on the square lattice. And I will look at single spin flip terms and two spin flip terms. Now, a single spin flip term, if you delocalize it over the lattice, it's just a magnon excitation, so just the block wave of single spin flip situated at the site RL. But for the two magnon excitations, you can uh, write the basis states like this, in this um, mixed representation where K would be the center of mass momentum of the two spin flips, and R would be their relative distance. And then in this two magnon space, you find two types of excitations. One is the continuum states, and the other is so-called bound states. And the bound states have lower energy than the continuum. The easiest argument for understanding why these bound states exist is the following. A single spin flip, if you only have nearest neighbor interaction, costs you four times the exchange energy to the nearest neighbors. If you have a single spin flip here, another one here, you have to pay penalty eight times J. However, when you put two spin, spin flips on nearest neighbor sites, they only have six total neighbors. And so there is a potential energy gain associated with putting two spins close to each other. This is why magnets extract each other and want to form bound pairs. You also see it in a bosonized form. If you look at this density density like term, you see that you have minus times minus is positive. But to make this Paramagnetic JZ has to be negative, so you get a negative interaction density times density, so magnets attract each other. And now we ask the question, if we add DMI to this, then we know that we couple these two sectors, because in the bosonic language we have these three body terms. Or also in the spin language you combine an SZ component plus a, uh, and a plus minus component, so you change the number of spin flips, which just means that you couple the Hilbert spaces of single magnon and two magnon excitations. You break spin space um, rotation symmetry, the, you break the one symmetry, and this is why um, spin is not a good quantum number, which is why you couple the two sectors. And now we are particularly interested in the situation where the energies of a magnon crosses that of a two magnon bound state, which I just for brevity call bi magnon, because then we have hope that once the DMI leads to hybridization between these two types of excitations, we would get this anti crossing that potentially could be topological. Now let me show you an example of this spin one half model uh, on the square lattice by switching on all of the interactions step by step. So first, let's assume that we only have conserving interactions between nearest neighbors, so only this term here. And let's assume that this exchange matrix is completely isotropic. So this would just reduce to S dot S, dot S term. Then we can diagonalize this Hamiltonian in the 
one and two body space, so the truncated Hilbert space. And we would find not only the single Markman state, which is this black line, gold stone mode, and then this cosine behavior, but we also find the two Markman continuum, which is the combination of any two one Markman excitations. And then finally, we also find the bi Markmans, whose energy is below the continuum because of this potential energy gain. Now, the, as a next step, we can make the Z components of the spin interact more strongly with each other. In that case, we get out the Goldstone mode because we break um, the rotational symmetry of the Hamiltonian. And we also increase the interactions between Markmans, which is why now the bi Markmans completely separate from the continuum. So now they are like really um, well defined quasi particles over the entire Brion zone. Now we want Magnons and bi Magnons to cross in energy, so we add some further neighbor interactions which just bends the Magnons in a particular way that we would like to see. And then we switch on the DMI, and indeed we see that it leads to hybridization between single Magnons and bi Magnons. Once you calculate the churn numbers of these objects, you find that they are different from zero. So we would expect that there is a chiral edge state in the band gap between the second and the third band. Once we um, look into that with open boundary conditions, we indeed see that these are the bulk band projections of the second and third blue band, and indeed we see that there is a chiral edge state. One positive velocity, the other overall negative velocity. Um, what I plot here in color is once the spin spin correlation function, and here the spin pair correlation function. So that tells you something about the single particleness, and this tells you something about the two particleness. And due to the hybridization between the two, you see that these edge states carry weight not only in the single particle sector, but also in the two micron sector. So the chiral edge state that you would get is a single particle, two particle hybrid. Now, I told you in the beginning that for Magnon topology, you need non Bravais lattices. Obviously, the square lattice is not a non Bravais lattice. However, these bound states somehow circumvent this restriction and can be understood as follows. If you are in the strong coupling limit, you can approximate the bound states as excitations at directly nearest neighbors, so they are as small as possible. Such an excitation has a center of mass that lives between two sides of the original square lattice. So effectively, what we do when we look at these hybridizations is we have single spin flip terms. Those are the magnets, the yellow spheres here that lives at the square lattice sites. But the two magnet bound states live at the center of mass momentum, either in x or in y direction. So you effectively map the problem onto a type binding model onto a non Bravais lattice here, this the leap lattice. And this creates then the necessary ingredients to get topological excitations. Is this also why the two magnet spectrum is so flat? Um, because the lab has this zero energy playing in the other Right. Um, most probably so. I mean, it, it just becomes flat because in this strong coupling limit, also physically, the hopping is rather small because you need a coherent hopping of two excitations. And this becomes perturbatively small in this limit. Now, here I just flash um, a result that you can extend this idea of two magnon bound states hybridizing with magnons in spin one systems, where you get a different kind of bound state because for spin one systems you can put two spin flips on one side. So, this is a single ion bound state whose energy can be controlled by the single ion anisotropy. And the story is quite similar. So in the fully isotropic case, you get the same result. But then for large single ion anisotropy, you not only get these exchange bound states, but also a single ion bound state, this yellow line here, which then can hybridize in the case with DMI with the magnon states. And if you play around with parameters, you can also realize phases with higher churn numbers where the band gap is um, rather small, but one zero. In this case, again, we see the chiral edge states, in which have single particle and two particle character. And here, the situation is a little bit different. So you don't map it onto a leap lattice. 
but since now at each side you have two kinds of flavors, you have a single spin flip and a double spin flip, you get something like an orbital degree of freedom, so you have two kinds of flavors of excitations per side. Now something like this has already been seen in experiments, so for example in iron dye iodide, um, it was argued that these neutron scattering data can only be explained by including single microns and single ion bound states. In particular, this hybridization here, so this blue band between the yellow bands is due to the hybridization between the two. And also other quantum excitations in the case of tritons, for example, has been argued that neutron scattering data consists the two triton bound states cutting through the triton excitations and that also leads to excitation, uh, to hybridization. So let me just summarize the difference between topological microns and these topological hybrids of microns and bimicrons. The main message is as follows. You can get these micron bimicrons on any lattices, in particular Bravé lattices, but it is a genuine quantum mechanical effect because it disappears in the limit of large S. And this is easy to understand because for topological microns, you can just calculate the microns also with landau lipschitz gilbert phenomenology, which also works in the classical limit. For micron by microns, one can show that the attractive potential between microns that binds the micron together actually scales as 1 over s relative to the free theory. So as you send s to infinity, the attractive potential goes away and the by microns then just cling to the continuum and you can't get them hybridized with the microns. But this means in particular now that due to the topology, you also get a Barry curvature, of course, and the thermal Hall effect. And we estimated the thermal Hall effect as a function of temperature for different anisotropies for the square lattice on half system. And the main message is you get numbers for the thermal Hall effect that's pretty similar as for just microns producing a thermal Hall effect. So this could be a important mechanism for explaining intrinsic contributions to thermal Hall effects in quantum magnets. With that, I would like to close. I acknowledge um, that this work was done in a large collaboration. I have shown results um, obtained together with the groups of Yelena Kinovala, Kinovala and Daniel Loss at Basel University, and also with researchers from the Max Planck Institute in Dresden, and also at the Okinawa Institute for Science and Technology. With that, let me just give you one take home message, and this is that micron micron interactions lead to interesting novel topological effects in quantum magnets, and there's much and more to be explored in this direction. And now I'm looking forward to your questions, and thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Alex, and it was really clear and really nice work. Um, I have a lot of questions, but I think I'm going to ask two of them. Uh, so, I have one for slide 19. Yes, for this one. Sorry. Yeah, yeah it's okay. <laughs> now, now I uh, overshoot. <laughs> yeah, so. For this particular, yeah, for this case, you have a zigzag termination, and then you see those Carlisle modes. What about the armchair termination? Right, uh, excellent question. Um, we did not calculate that, but I guarantee you that it will also uh, exist. In the okay, because I know from graphene, if you do it for different terminations, then you get different physics. So maybe. The, okay, that, that's very true. But I would argue, since we were able to show that. A, there are parallel edge states, and we also know that the bulk theory maps onto something that has parallel edge state. It's pretty clear that at the armchair you would also get okay. these parallel edge states, but in principle I agree it would be even better proof if I also <laughs> had this data available. Okay, perfect. Okay. And then one final for slide 26 um, is where you showed that the, maybe, yeah, you showed that the DMI interaction that, op that opens up a gap. Um, could you say that the DMI accounts for some effective spin orbit coupling yes. in C and CI? Yes, so, okay. yeah, exactly. So, that's the point. So the <coughs> DMI does derive from spin orbit coupling, also microscopically. <coughs> so it's the first order spin orbit correction to the um, non-relativistic S dot S Heisenberg exchange. And um, 
yeah, in principle, um, the idea is kind of similar to the rough bar model, where you would also get just spin orbits with bands, and then you have something that breaks time reversal symmetry explicitly, like a magnetic field, and then you get also get topological effects there. Okay, thanks. Are there more questions? Uh, I have a comment about uh, the first question. Yes. So I think that I agree with you that here that it doesn't matter that you have uh, used up the raw materials. Because there, in the, the retain and the transport of things that we have, you see here that we don't have any difference between the solids. Right. Yeah. But then there, I mean, the, in the electron system, the graphene that we have existing of the solid is A rather than B, that we, get, we have different features. So see that here that you're using some kind of a packet, and then there isn't any difference between the stuff that is A and B that you're just copying the magnetization. So I, I mean, if um, if I extended this model to make the shot that is different, yeah. then of course there would be an additional mass to it. The yes. seven of mass to it could <coughs> counteract the topological, or could counteract the topological yeah. sure. close and free open the closed yeah. yeah. so, so in principle, I would say this arm chain six is of course also different, but Topology guarantees that there at least will be the chiral edge. This is all, all I can guarantee. Yeah. Maybe I have one. Yeah, first round is two magnets place, so it has a angular momentum to h bar, right? Exactly. So is it possible that we share a light into the system so it can couple to the two magnet state by some, in some, by emitting two photons, so it can help to generate some squeezed light? Uh, right, so um, I think if you look, for example, at a two photon Raman process, mm -hmm. then those should see the bound states. Mm -hmm. So I think if you look at the um, sequence in Raman spectroscopy, and um, you could you need to take into account the bound states to kind of account for the peaks that you're seeing. Now, in terms of squeezing, I would also think so. Mm -hmm. um, so here I was careful to choose lattices with a fully polarized ferromagnetic ground state, which are kind of um, cooked up or very carefully chosen. In principle, if you have uh, systems where um, you get magnon pairing and a reduction due to quantum fluctuations of the ordered moment, then I think one should work out um, the theory you are suggesting that um, squeezed light would also couple to everything. But this is something we still have to look at. Oh, thank you. I would actually suggest that we close the session. Alexander is here also uh, the afternoon and tomorrow. So if you have more questions, Alexander, I think you can find them either through me or directly. He's in the office all the way at the end of the corridor, the Majorana office. Uh, so let's thank Alexander again for the nice talk.